Hello and welcome to this fourth edition of the COP Conversations mini-series. For those of you that have been tuning in to the first few episodes of this series, you'll notice that I'm not Professor Rana Mitter. My name is Peter Drobak. I'm the director of the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at Oxford Said Business School. And I'm really excited to be with you today in his stead. Um, if I could have chosen an episode of this series to be involved with, it would be this one. Removing carbon from the atmosphere is a bold idea. It actually sounds a little bit crazy. And the fact that it's something that we even have to contemplate just underscores the severity and the urgency of the climate crisis. But is it actually possible? How would it actually work? And what are the potential unintended consequences of you know, re-engineering our planet and our systems in such a profound way? Well, here to help us answer these questions and more today is Professor Roz Rickaby, Chair of Geology at Oxford's Department of Earth Sciences. Throughout her career, Roz has pioneered interdisciplinary blend of biology and chemistry to resolve questions of past climates, evolution, and the future of phytoplankton. In 2008, Roz received the European Geoscience Union's Outstanding Young Scientist Award, and she recently co-authored the book, Evolution's Destiny, Co-Evolving Chemistry of the Environment and Life. Now, before we get started with Roz, just a little bit of housekeeping. Note that today's talk will last around 15 minutes, and after that, we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A, and we do want to hear from you. You can send in questions through either the chat window on YouTube or the comment section of Twitter or Facebook. However you're dialing in, there should be a place for you to, um, to uh, insert your questions, and feel free to throw them forward all the way out throughout the talk, and we'll try to get as many as we can in during the Q&A. Um, note that we're working off different Wi-Fi setups. I'm actually speaking to you from Cheltenham. Shout out to the Workplace Cheltenham for hosting me here today. Um, so bear with us um, if there are any technology issues. And that's it. Um, Roz, welcome to COP Conversations. Please take it away. Well, thanks so much, Peter. And, and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to one of these, these COP Conversations. It's, uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here. And I'm really looking forward to... Um, uh, interchanging with, with a number of people uh, as we have the opportunity in the next half hour or so. So I guess I want to really use this opportunity to introduce you to how the earth works with respect to carbon and how that can inform potential solutions moving forward where we may want to accelerate those processes to remove carbon from the atmosphere. So th 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 I've really highlighted the we in the question here. It's kind of we, uh, and what I'll show you in the first part of the talk is how the earth will respond to these inputs of carbon dioxide and then to show what the exploratory avenues may be for actually coming up with a, with a solution. So my first slide is showing you that the natural earth carbon cycle that takes place on millions of years. So we have emissions of carbon dioxide from volcanoes which go into the atmosphere. Some of that CO2 carbon dioxide dissolves in rainwater, creates carbonic acid, and that flows back into the ocean. And so we have emissions of CO2, about one gigaton of carbon dioxide a year, that then is removed by this process of weathering, which ultimately generates organic carbon and calcium carbonate in the ocean. And those are returned via subduction uh, back to the interior of the earth. And some of that comes back out as CO2. So that is the typical scale at which the earth breathes out CO2 and inhales CO2 on long million year timescales. And this is a fantastic mechanism because in actual fact, it has worked to keep the earth habitable for hundreds, if not thousands of millions of years. So if there's any perturbation here, let's say volcanoes for some reason, something like more organic carbon has gone down the subduction chute, emit more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, that warms the earth and that warming acts to accelerate chemical weathering, the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So we have this natural thermostat that any warming is naturally um, uh, removed or any CO2 that's, that, that's uh, put into the atmosphere is naturally removed from that system and taken back into the ocean and down into the sediments. So the, the, the Earth, in a way, on, on long geological timescales, has this fantastic stabilizing forces at play. 
And this is demonstrated in this in this next figure, just to show you that this is this is a, an Earth system model that tries to account for these various feedbacks in the system, including weathering. And I'll talk about some of the other feedbacks that shows if we perturb the system on, on a sort of hundred year time scale, as we've done on anthropogenic time scales. Now they're using a load of 100 gigatons of car, oh, sorry, a thousand gigatons of carbon or 5000 gigatons of carbon. And this is just putting it in in, in say, the year 2000. So it's, it's a short term perturbation, but of a scale similar to that which we've done from the burning of fossil fuels and land use change. And you can see there are natural earth system feedbacks. We put this in on a very short time scale and those natural earth system feedbacks. So the carbon starts to equilibrate with the ocean and land and starts to drop down on the time scale of, of hundreds of years. So going up to the year 3000. Then on even longer time scales, that extra carbon dioxide is neutralized by mixing with limestone sediments at the bottom of the ocean. It enters to the ocean and those limestone sediments start to dissolve and buffer that, that carbon dioxide in the same way a Rennie would, would buffer your acid indigestion. So that happens on 10,000 year time scales. And then when we get into the long uh, million year time scale, this is now going up 20 to hundreds of, th of thousands of years into the future, that weathering feedback kicks in and removes the CO2 as if that perturbation never occurred. So to a geologist, what we're doing is, is a mere blip in geological history and the earth system will naturally remove that carbon from the atmosphere, but it's gonna take a long time. It's going to take millions of years of time. And we don't have that time. So the, the, all the IPCCs are, are pointing to this fact that if we want to adhere to the Paris Agreement of one and a half degrees of warming, then we have to remove on the order of 100 to 1,000 gigatons of CO2 over the 21st century. So just on the left here, this is showing you a range of scenarios for how to try and achieve that 1.5 degrees C of warming. And you'll see around 2050, we're looking at, we, we really need what's, what's termed now net zero emissions, i.e. no additional CO2 um, uh, net positive emissions further going into the atmosphere. And indeed these various trajectories require both reduction in emissions and this removal on the order of one to 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide a year. And this is a big undertaking. Let's again, just look at the short-term carbon cycle. I've shown you the long-term carbon cycle. We're now looking at the short-term carbon cycle. This is looking from the year 1750 up to 2010 or so. And we've had emissions that have risen up to on the order of now, this is on 10 gigatons of carbon, but that's equivalent of 40 gigatons of CO2. I'm just translating the carbon to CO2 there. So we're really emitting enormous amounts of carbon dioxide, and this is from the burning of fossil fuels and the change in land use. And you can see on the bottom the sinks that have occurred on that time scale. So in the green, this is the residual land sink. So the terrestrial biosphere, forests and trees are taking up some of that carbon, about a third of that carbon is going into the terrestrial biosphere today. Indeed, it's being fertilized by that rise in, in CO2. We're also putting additional carbon into the ocean on the order of about nine gigatons of carbon dioxide per year is taken up into the oceans. And so over the and the remaining third, so we've really got about a third going into the land carbon reservoirs, we've got about a third going into the ocean and a third is accumulating in the atmosphere and that's what's giving us our warming of today. And it's estimated that over the past 200 years, in fact, the oceans have been really working for us. They've taken up about 500 gigatons of, of CO2 from this cumulative 1300 gigatons of CO2 total anthropogenic emissions. So again, the Earth system is working to help us by removing a large two thirds of the CO2 that we've put, been putting into the atmosphere. So let's think about how the Earth system could potentially help us remove even further CO2 from the atmosphere. And indeed, there is this fantastic natural experiment that we can peer at as geologists that have occurred in the last 800,000 years. And we have records of what's happened to both temperature and carbon dioxide recorded in these fantastic ice cores that are uh, uh, collected from Antarctica. So they contain these little bubbles of gas that get incorporated into the ice as snow falls and gradually compresses into ice. And we have this wonderful record of atmospheric CO2 showing the bumps up and down alongside global temperatures as we've gone into and out of 
uh, uh, glacial and interglacial conditions. So ice sheets have grown CO at times of low CO2, ice sheets have reduced at times of high CO2. And we've had natural changes on the order of about 100 ppm of V of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So from this, we know that actually the glacial ocean, just thinking about the atmosphere, carbon dioxide being removed from uh, the atmosphere, it has to have been the ocean to have allowed this almost rapid time scale. I'll, I'll talk about this as a rapid geology time scale that it, it's removed about 800 of gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere into the ocean. And as geologists, we're fairly sure it's gone into the ocean because this has that exchangeable reservoir on the order of, of, of 10,000 years or so. Not only that, we know that the ice sheets were much larger. They were much larger such that sea levels globally were 120 meters lower. There was 120 meters equivalent of ice on, on the land. And the impact of that was actually to massively reduce the terrestrial biosphere, that other fantastic reservoir of carbon that, that can be so dynamic on these timescales. So the glacial ocean had to store not just the carbon from the atmosphere, but an additional 2,800 gigatons of CO2 as a rough estimate from this reduced terrestrial biosphere. So in total, it was able to um, store 3,600 gigatons of carbon dioxide, but it took about 50,000 years to do that. So we're talking about 0.07 gigatons of carbon dioxide uh, of, of CO2 per year was the typical rate at which that CO2 was stored in the ocean. How did it happen? And this is a, this is a real cocktail of, of, of different mechanisms. When we think of CO2 interactions with the ocean, we think of equilibration. So the more carbon you've got in the atmosphere, the more you get in the surface ocean. But the ocean can act to pull that into the ocean by changing the chemistry of that equilibrium. If we raise the pH of the ocean, for example, we can, reduce, we can draw down more carbon. If we lower the temperature, we can draw down more carbon. There's then the biology in the ocean, which is the, all the organisms. There's a whole forest of tiny unicellular organisms. They use up carbon, they die, they drop to the bottom of the ocean, they take the carbon with them. So we've got chemistry interacting with that equilibration of CO2. We've got biology pulling the CO2 down into the ocean. And we've got the physics, and that is essentially the mixing of the ocean. How, how much is the CO2 that gets remineralized at depth brought back to the surface and then re-equilibrates with the atmosphere? And it's this cocktail of mechanisms that many modelers believe have, have given us this um, drawdown of carbon dioxide. So the cooling of the ocean, this stratification, there's a greater density contrast, so more carbon can be stored in the deep ocean. There's iron fertilization. The, the glacial world was much dustier. There's iron being put into the ocean, and that is fertilizing phytoplankton blooms that are taking more carbon into the deep ocean just accounting for this land carbon reduction. And we've then got sea level change and the loss of the coral reefs. I've told you that sea levels drop. So that reveals the, the shallow continental shelves where all the coral reefs grow and they take out limestone today. And the impact of that re reduction in sea level is that that limestone is essentially added to the ocean and makes them more alkaline. And that draws down CO2 into the deep ocean. So the glacial world shows us this cocktail of mechanisms using biology, physics, and chemistry to draw CO2 down into the, into the ocean. And this indeed is what seems to be inspiring the range of techniques that we have that are being worked on in various academic and industrial ways to try and remove carbon from the atmosphere. So the raw ingredients for these are plants. I've talked about the terrestrial biosphere, the, 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 the land plants being a good source or, or sink of CO2. And indeed, these, this, this um, approach to manipulating the terrestrial biosphere is at the heart of a number of different carbon storage mechanisms. Plants have mastered the taking up of CO2 at, at very low levels from the atmosphere. And we can potentially harness that for biomass, energy, carbon and direct carbon capture and storage. We can potentially use forests for building with biomass. And a large part of manipulating this is, is trying to protect against the loss of, of our, our biomass on, on land and, and re restoring many of our peatlands, many of the, 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 the um, coastal ecosystems got the potential for low carbon concrete, mineral carbonation. And then there are ideas out there for applying minerals to agricultural or indeed just upland territories where we can enhance that weathering, that long-term geological CO2 drawdown. 
or raising ocean alkalinity. As I showed you in the glacial world, we lost the coral reefs, that addition of, of what I term alkalinity or, or basicity, however you want to say it, to the ocean. There are potentially ways of doing that. Or we can fertilize the oceans. We can, we can try and, and, and create those, those algal blooms that will take carbon down into the deep ocean. And all of this is to enhance the store of carbon, either in geological reservoirs, the built environment, the land store or the ocean store. There are some challenges afoot. So one of those challenges, which is, is starting to um, become highlighted is of course this idea that we've been pushing carbon into the atmosphere so that it's, it's equilibrating with the ocean and with the terrestrial biosphere. If we actually start removing emissions to the point where we get to net negative emissions, some of that CO2 will start to come back out. And so this panel on the left is, is showing you where the anthropogenic carbon is, is modeled to be in the ocean today. The red um, colors are, are showing where we're, we've now got much enhanced carbon in the ocean because we've been pushing it into the atmosphere. And if we then start to have net negative emissions, that CO2, I showed you that chemical equilibration, will start to come back out of the ocean. And this, there is the same potential challenge of, of the terrestrial biosphere. So that's just a, a little schematic on the right hand side, just showing if we start having these net negative emissions, then some of these carbon stores that, that have naturally been taking the carbon out of the atmosphere for us will start to re-release them. And this is just a, a prospect from a, 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 an institute within Oxford now, the Oxford Net Zero uh, uh, Consortia. We're trying to think about future durable net zero uh, uh, possibilities. I, I, I'm running a little low on time, so I won't go through all these options, but it's just to show that in the short term, yes, we can try and enhance our, our biomass uh, on land. The terrestrial biosphere is a potential um, fantastic way. This is, it's a kind of no brainer really to reforest the planet. But those terrestrial stores are fairly limited. We're always going to have competition between land use and, and feeding the nations. Uh, 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 and, and these terrestrial, these various, if we want to do BEX, bio, biomass uh, 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 energy and carbon capture, then we really need to think very carefully about land use change. So the terrestrial biosphere is, is a useful short term store, but ultimately for a durable net zero, we need these um, balances of, of carbon into each of these spheres, the lithosphere, the atmosphere, and the land and ocean biosphere to be much more balanced. There are always going to be residual emissions from aviation and agriculture, which are very difficult to, to, to eliminate, but we need to reach a point where we're actually being able to put carbon back into the, into the lithosphere, the geological stores, and reduce our load on the atmosphere. So this is our sort of vision that's coming out in, the, in a forthcoming paper in, in the next couple of months. Just to show that a, a very recent report from Bayes and the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology are coming up with scenarios for the UK in terms of what a mosaic of different solutions may look like for sequestering carbon from direct air, carbon capture and storage, going to habitat restoration. And this is their sort of balanced scenario. It just came out in, in this month, in fact, uh, looking at these various, the, the projected um, readiness of those technologies to be rolled out and what our mosaic may look like for 2050 in order to realize net zero in the UK. I guess I was I was I kept on trying to figure out what these megatons of CO2 equivalents are and, and it really is so it's just a tenth of that which we need globally in order to take the globe to net zero. And for me, this, the stark uh, impact of that is just how much this is going to cost. So this is on the order of 10 billion pounds uh, 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 per year to realize that CO2 uh, storage. And that's for various scenarios that this report has looked at. That's the typical cost of, of, of those um, stores. So if we go back to the original question, can we remove carbon from the atmosphere? I think undoubtedly, yes. In fact, the carbon will be removed for us if we just sat back and did nothing, but it will take a long time for that to happen. So the, the answer is, is, is a very positive yes. 
I think the challenge is we have to speed up both the reduction of CO2 emissions and enhance removal, but we need a catalyst for that change. And the catalyst potentially is market forces. That's something I'm less qualified to talk about, but those in Oxford Net Zero are, 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 are very able to. But the big question is who is going to pay for this? And I think as an earth scientist, I think the real challenge is what are those unintended consequences of any one of those deploying any one of those techniques at scale where we're really speeding up a process by 10 to 100 fold above its natural level. And so thank you very much for your attention and I'll, I'll, I'll take any questions and start the conversation. Ross, thank you so much. Uh, it was wonderful the way you were able to really break down this incredibly complex uh, science in a way that even I could understand. And it's always refreshing um, to speak to a geologist who works, operates on a different clock than the rest of us and, and, and helping us think um, you know, on the order of, uh, you know, of millions of years, um, you know, and, uh, and, and recognize that we're just little specks um, in the arc of history, although I'll be a very disruptive specks. Um, we've got a lot of great questions that I want to get to in a moment. A lot of them are around sort of um, the thinking about nature-based solutions versus more kind of technological interventions. Um, one of the things that struck me, and I think also struck um, uh, Steve P, it was the, the, the graph that you showed from the IPCC, um, uh, and that no that actually we can't meet our targets unless we make some interventions to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Do you believe that to be the case? Yes, I think without a doubt. And I, I, I think in a way that was where that, that those net zero schematics, which I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't explain particularly well, I guess that the, the first scenario was sort of showing that if we emit, if we continue to emit, we're going to need large scale geological storage. And I guess in, in a way that is, um, we have to remove carbon from the atmosphere. I think it's almost impossible to hit the one and a half degree temperature limit without doing that. Um, you know, I guess the, the, the idea of the net zero, which is where you're thinking about cumulative emissions, you know, we have a certain amount of carbon that we can put into the atmosphere to reach that one and a half degree C target. And the question for us is how we, re we use up the remaining reservoir of carbon that we can emit. But alongside that, we absolutely need to start removing carbon. And I, I guess the, the, the point of the net zero schematic is to show that it is unsustainable to still emit carbon at the rate that we are going on and try and sequester it at the same time. And I suppose that's the, the scaling question. So we need to reach a point where we have limited emissions from as many industries as possible so that that arrow going from the, the geosphere almost into the atmosphere is as small as we can get it, mm -hmm. that then makes the engineering of that carbon storage a scale that is manageable and affordable, I guess, you know, I mean, I, we can argue about, about what affordable means, I think, but, um, you know, we, we need to, the, the engineering solutions are not simple and they are, as I say, I, I am very nervous about, you know, I, I've been involved a bit with enhanced rock weathering, for example, let's, let's take one idea of let's scale up this very natural process which occurs and, and make it go a lot faster. And there is the idea of, of spreading crushed rock on agricultural lands. And, that, and indeed, there are many co-benefits to that, it would seem. It improves soil health, it improves um, crop uh, production rates, which is fantastic. Um, it's still to be seen how much carbon can be sequestered from that approach. But the challenge is that in that basalt that you're putting onto the land, you're adding a whole range of different chemistries, a whole load of iron, a whole load of, of manganese, a whole load of all sorts of different elements. And you're going to then accelerate their input into the ocean at a 10 to 100 fold time, its natural uh, rate. And that will have, you know, iron, for example, will fertilize the oceans enormously. And, and OK, that may help storage, but there may be elements that are also toxic to the ecosystem that are being released at incredibly high rates. And, and so that is that's that's the point that I suppose I want to make is that, that, that there are storage uh, there are capture and storage possibilities open to us, but if we have to deploy them at an enormous scale, there will almost certainly be unintended consequences. 
Thank you. And I want to come back to that in a, in a moment, but a huge take home for me and I think many of others who don't follow this as closely as uh, scientists like you is that even if we did everything right in terms of reducing emissions, which we almost certainly won't, that still won't be enough. So these yeah. questions that you're going through with us today are really questions of, of, of not whether we should, but what and how we might approach this, uh, which, is, which is really humbling. Um, you showed us this brilliant graph to, to demonstrate something I didn't know, which is how great, the, um, how great a job the earth has done at absorbing a lot of our excess CO2 emissions over the last several decades. And actually the majority of our, of our um, excess emissions um, you know, have been absorbed by you know, land and sea, but of course we have still exceeded that and, and tipped ourselves out of equilibrium. So maybe let's start then with nature-based solutions um, and we have a lot of questions on this um, from uh, Lauren P, for example, who says, how important is rewilding then? Um, uh, things like restoring peatland, is this more important than any kind of tech-based solutions in your mind? I think it is. I, 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 this is this is something that, again, there, there are a number of experts in the university that are uh, uh, pioneering, I guess, in nature-based solutions. And I think the rewilding, the, the preserving of any ecosystem that we can is a is a it's a double win because it not only uh, preserves it can restore carbon sinks natural carbon sinks that we have, but it also preserves biodiversity and and we know that the the but the ecosystems are incredibly fragile. And biodiversity is the key to survival. I mean, it, it plays out, I guess, in, in any, any system that diversity is the key to survival and resilience. Um, and so it's, it's, it is to me a no brainer that we should be trying to restore our peatlands, restoring coastal ecosystems, restoring mangroves. All of these ecosystems need, need attention. And, and I think that the afforestation is, is an interesting challenge. I think we, we need to think somewhat carefully. It, it, the, 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 there needs to be consideration of this dual fold impact of trees on the planet. Trees store carbon, but they also, depending on where they are on the planet, they can change the reflectivity of the surface. So if we have a lot of trees where you've got leaves and they've got dark leaves, they can change how much of Earth's sunlight is reflected or absorbed. Mm -hmm. And so we, we need to, again, it, it, it's this, I guess, the great fun thing about Earth sciences is um, it's interdisciplinarity. So we need to not just think about the chemistry of forests, but we also need to think about the physics and how they're impacting the, the reflectivity of the surface of the planet. Just to build on that, Liz asked um, whether there are things in nature that are better than others at taking carbon. And do we want to think about whether, for example, trees are better than marshland or, um, you know, how do we think about these nature based interventions? Oh wow, that's that's a good question. I'm not I'm not sure I want to make a hierarchy of of, of nature in terms of I think it's, you know trees are great. Um, the, the 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 fantastic part about trees is they're so adaptable. They store carbon, and there are now some fantastic uh, architectural stroke engineering solutions trying to use timber in construction and ways of, of making them fire retardant. And so I, I, I trees are great in that 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 um from that perspective the the marshlands i i don't want to say anyone is better but i guess it's it's it, the, the, yeah we, we we should try any kind of restoration of nature um you love, all your, you love all your children equally i understand yeah yeah, yeah exactly exactly and uh, but it is interesting I, I i haven't got my slides up but to go back to the uk scenarios and actually a large proportion of of those scenarios for trying to get to net zero by 2050 do involve those nature-based solutions and it, it was kind of interesting to see that that actually many of the technologies direct air capture you know these enhanced weathering ideas they're still not at a, a deployable level of technology readiness, I would say, but I think all the conservation and, and the res restoring of habitats, we're at a point where if we can do it, we should just do it. There's, there, it there is no reason not to. Right, and it's really heartening to hear that because I think a lot of us have concerns about these technologies which are just really nascent that we don't fully understand that maybe haven't even really fully been invented yet. 
um, as has been pointed out by some of our, our, our viewers. And so let's maybe just turn to that um, for a moment. Pippa asks um, what you think about the sort of current theories on the, the technology side of um, carbon removal or sequestration and storage and how big a role do you think that can or should play relative to nature-based solutions? I know we weren't able to get into all of those things in this talk, but um, maybe just give me your 30,000 foot view. Okay, well, I, I know that if, if Miles Allen were to be sitting in, the, in this seat, he would say we absolutely need to be able to put carbon back into geological reservoirs. This is, this is the, the, the um, I guess, the big bang for your buck. You know, one of the challenges of, of, of many of these carbon dioxide removal techniques is that you don't get any scaling effect. I, I saw a talk where, you know, you, you basically have a mole of, I don't know, silicate rock and you take out a mole of carbon dioxide. You, there, there's no kind of thing where you've got a small thing and you take out 10 moles of carbon dioxide. The only one that really gives that to you is, is the injection of CO2 back into geological reservoirs. And it's it's a very fertile area of research. And it, again, it's, it's a shame that the oil companies are not pushing this forward because they have the infrastructure, they have the technology, they have the know-how how to do this. And um, it's a shame that they are not pushing this as quickly forward as it could be done, because I, I do believe that that could be, you know, many of those techniques, again, are, are looking for capture and storage, and that is the solution. Again, there are unintended consequences. I have a, have a colleague, Mike Kendall, who is very much worrying about the seismicity. You know, if we start injecting all of, of these CO2 into these various reservoirs, then there is potential to reactivate faults and have some low level um, uh, release of seismicity. And, and so again, we need the research to assess the safety of these techniques. But I, I think that's perhaps one that, one that is closest to being deployed in terms of a, a technology and its capacity I think is much greater than what we might achieve via nature-based solutions. Yeah thank you. Um, earth to oil companies your business model is going extinct and Roz is just giving you a way to save your business. Um, look to the future and it has arrived. Um, let's just turn to unintended consequences. We're going to go a few minutes over because we've had such great um, questions here. Um, but I want to dig into that further. Um, there's this brilliant book that I recently read by Elizabeth Colbert. I think it's called Under a White Sky, which is sort of a look at um, um, some examples of when humans have tried to intervene in natural ecosystems um, for, you know, for various reasons and introducing invasive species and things like that. Suffice it to say, our history has not been so good. Our track record is not so good. Good. Um, and there are often and almost as a rule but unintended consequences. How worried um, about that are you? You mentioned a couple of them that some of your colleagues are thinking about and concerned about, but are we, are we talking about manageable unintended consequences or is there a risk that some of these interventions could really go sideways in ways that we couldn't predict? That's a, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, let me, I guess that the, the, the I'm quite nervous, let's say, about manipulating the ocean. I, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's a shame in many ways because it is, as I, as I tried to show, it's a, it's a reservoir that has more than sufficient capacity to take up the amount of carbon dioxide that we need it to. Um, but there, I guess there's, there's been a history over, let's say, the last 10, 20 years of, of trying to perform iron fertilization experiments. And uh, so, so this is something where we know the ocean today is limited by iron for, uh, uh, because iron is highly insoluble. It, it's rusting, you know, so it, it rusts out and, and you, you don't have very much iron dissolved in the ocean. And yet everything requires large amounts of iron. So there have been a number of experiments actually going out, deploying and, and spreading iron into, into various little patches in the ocean. And yes, you get an algal bloom. And, and so you kind of think, well, that's great. But if you start thinking about any process which is going to fertilize the ocean, you're going to create more organic matter. That organic matter then requires oxygen to break it down. I sort of talked about this remineralization process, almost respiration of that, that organic matter that's then releasing CO2, but it uses up oxygen at the same time. And we know at the moment that the oxygen levels in the ocean are going down. There are these awful sort of suffocating zones of the ocean, the oxygen minimum zones, which is growing. And this has happened in the last 50 years as a, partly related to, to global warming. 
And we could aggravate that horribly if we start to manipulate the ocean ecosystem. And there are all sorts of ideas, or maybe we could grow seaweed on platforms and then dump the seaweed down in the deep ocean. And that will all use up oxygen in, in the deep ocean. And, and that has big implications for where fish can live, anything that requires oxygen, all aerobic organisms in the ocean. So I agree with you that uh, I'm nervous about manipulating the ocean. I think restoring habitats and ecosystems back to where they were as best we can is fine. The geological storage, I think we need to resolve, let's say, a methodology which shows that we can inject the CO2 without inducing seismicity or we can find the right places that will allow us to do that. There are fantastic approaches that are putting CO2 in geothermal uh, uh, power stations where they're taking CO2 and re-injecting it and there it, it remineralizes out as, as calcium carbonate. And I, I I'm trying to think if there's an unintended consequence of that. I'm, I'm not sure I know what. I think that that is really fantastic, but there are only few places in the in the world that you can do that. There's a, a fantastic project in Iceland at the moment, Carb Fix, and I, I know there are ideas to try and develop that in places like East Africa. Um, so what would I say? I, I'm nervous about manipulation in the ocean, um, uh, but I think that some of the geological stores and the nature stores are open to, to intervention. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm struggling to think of what the unintended consequences are of those. Yeah, well, I think that's a fantastic summary. So lead with nature-based solutions, storage, develop the other technologies, and in the meantime, accelerate all our efforts to quit dumping CO2 into the environment because every day that we do that is gonna make this problem even harder. Um, lots of other questions that we couldn't get to. Uh, I wanna encourage you to, um, all of you out there to check out the Oxford Net Zero Initiative. As Roz mentioned, a, a bunch of our colleagues are working on this. It's a phenomenal source of information and, and, and our colleagues are gonna be uh, all over COP26 and, in, in Glasgow and, and, and beyond and really important part of you know, this ongoing and very urgent conversation. Um, and I think you'd all agree with me that this um, uh, session was way too short. I wish we could go on, Roz, but thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, so to all of you out there, um, thank you for, um, for joining us today. Uh, we uh, will be back next week. If you want to access this talk or the previous talks that have been done, look for the webpage that should be at the bottom of your screens, um, wherever you're watching. Um, next week, we'll be right back here at the same time. That's Thursday, the 4th of November. Um, and uh, Rana will be back um, uh, along with um, uh, Nick Leach talking about how climate is changing our weather. Um, so if very, um, a very relevant um, look at um, the effects of climate change that we're already seeing. So please do tune into that. Thank you once again, Roz. Thanks to all of you for joining and we will see you next time. Goodbye.